and uh, he's flown all the way from New Zealand, so his arms are a little bit tired. But if you please join me in welcoming Bryce Langston to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, if you please join me in welcoming Cross Langston to the stage. Thank you very much. Oh, technical issues today. That's okay, this will not be my first time winging it. It's uh, raining outside, so you all can't go anywhere anyway. First tiny house celebrity slash writer of his own press releases, apparently. Anyway, I want to say a huge thank you to all of you for coming out today. It's absolutely my pleasure to be here. Hopefully that we can kick things off with this uh, presentation and catch things up to speed later, but uh, pretty sure I remember what I wrote on the pages anyway, so we should be okay. Uh, really what I want to do is I want to sort of move through the sort of presentation part as fast as I can so that we can have lots of time for Q&A. Uh, so if you do have any questions about Tiny houses in general, tiny house life, the show, filming, anything like that, I am going to make sure that there is plenty of time at the end where I can take questions. But for those of you who don't know me, I just wanted to kick things off by talking a little bit about my journey into tiny house living, how I came to be on this journey. So, back in 2013, I was an actor on a terrible New Zealand soap opera called Shulman Street. And I got called off the show. I was, I was drowned in a bathtub. It really is a terrible show. And I was left in a position where I had to pay rent in a very expensive Auckland apartment. And I was in one of the most unaffordable cities in the world when it comes to housing. I think at the time, house, uh, New Auckland sat at about number four on the Housing affordable, uh, Affordability Index with uh, an average of 12 times the average salary to purchase the average home. And I was feeling pretty lost. I didn't really know what to do. At that point in time, I was in my late 20s. And if I kept doing a job that I loved, I didn't know how I was going to ever be able to afford to actually buy my own home. And Fortunately, I also had a, a passion for permaculture. And as a result of that, I ended up in, at the permaculture convergence in 2013, where I met an earth boat builder by the name of Bowman. And Bowman had built these two very, very beautiful earthen home structures that I was immediately enamored with. I absolutely loved them. They were, they were small, they were simple, simple. They were, they were humble, but they were so cozy. And immediately in those structures, there was one thing that I recognized about it. It was enough. It was all that I needed. If I had something simple like that, a simple shelter over my head, then I knew that I would be able to weather the storms when they came my way, that I would be able to deal with being a bum, unemployed actor in a super expensive city, as long as I could maybe put it up on a permaculture farm where I could grow some veggies as well. And so, I started on the journey of learning to become an earth builder. I actually took an earth building apprenticeship and I started learning how to build an earthen home. But there was a problem. The land. Where do you put it? Where do you put a permanent structure that on, on land that you don't own? How, how does that actually work? And one day while I was researching small space design ideas, I came across a very special picture. And this picture is still completely cemented in my mind. And of course, it is the picture of Jay Schaefer in mm -hmm. his original OG tumbleweed tiny house on wheels, standing right in the middle of the highway, now completely iconic. And to me, when I saw that image, it was like an absolute explosion of ideas went off in my brain. This was a game-changing idea to me. Why? Because it meant that I could own my own home without needing to own the land that it sat on. For me, it felt achievable. This was something that I could actually do myself. 
And so I started the journey of building my own original tiny house on wheels. But I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to build my house to get into a form of affordable, simple living scenario. And so I uh, actually built a tent home. I built it out of an old bell tent. Now when I say that I live in a tent, it does make me sound a little bit home more homeless than I really was. It was a very plush tent. It was, it was glamping, really. But that was a really valuable experience for me because one of the things when I was first starting to get into the idea of living in a tiny house was that I had romanticized certain things. I had this idea that uh, I wanted an outdoor toilet, you know? So when you have to get up to pee at three o'clock in the morning, you go outside, you look up the sky, into the infinite universe and God's creation. But it's not until you're in the middle of a rainstorm and you're trying to figure out how to piss out of the canvas window at three o'clock in the morning that you realize, you know what? Maybe I should have a toilet inside the house. So making the journey into sort of starting to simply live gave me a little bit of insight into what was actually important. Oh, we've got it. Oh, yay. Does that mean, I, does this work now too? So here you go, these are the urban homes that I was talking about. This is iconic Mr. Jay Schaefer in his OG tiny house. And this here is my not so homeless tent structure uh, with the outdoor uh, bathroom. It was a very, very cool structure joined with a really nice uh, uh, rope bridge, which was super exciting at 3 a.m. or when you've had a couple of drinks. <laughs> and eventually this led me into building this here, which was my tiny house. They call this the seat of life. And this is still my home today, which I share with my lovely partner, Rasa, who also films the show with me. And this home, I named the Seed of Life because, firstly, I'm obsessed with sacred geometry. And lots of sacred geometry was actually incorporated into the design and the geometry of this house. But more so because, to me, it was the seed of my life. This gave my life new meaning, new purpose, a new place from which to grow. I didn't stop there with my tiny house journey. We built a tiny house on wheels in the United States as well. Long story short, as our show ended up sort of growing more overseas, we ended up filming more overseas, and we wanted to create a little bit of our home base for ourselves, where we were in America. And we ended up building this home. This was five by two and a half meters. It weighed about 4,000 pounds. And in the end, we ended up towing that, living in it for, uh, we towed it over about 37 states in the end, which was amazing. Until, unfortunately, we ended up getting grounded with COVID. And we ended up selling this home in the United States. And we've used a little bit of that money to put towards a new building project, which is coming out very, very soon on the channel, which is another uh, movable tiny house that we're going to take on the road all around New Zealand instead. But I want to talk a little bit about how I actually got into doing the YouTube show and sort of what inspired all of that. Well, obviously I was a bum unemployed actor and I wanted to do something. But also, have you guys ever watched that show Grand Designs? Yeah. Yeah. See, I loved Grand Designs. That was like my Saturday night with my family growing up. We'd have Chinese takeout and watch Grand Designs. But one of the things about watching Grand Designs was I would watch that show, and I would watch all of these incredible, beautiful, multi-million dollar architectural projects, but it didn't feel accessible. I didn't feel like I was ever actually going to be able to own one of those homes, build one of those homes one day. And I started wanting to create videos on my own build because I was so excited that I had found something that felt accessible and I looked around and I saw so many of my friends so many people in my age group suffering exactly the same problem that I was if you're in your 40s or younger in New Zealand Australia many countries around the world they now call us generation rent because we're a generation that's never expected to be able to own our own homes many people in our generation are expected to be renters for life and I wanted to share this idea that I was so excited about with the world. And the idea took off and people started watching the show, which was really exciting. 
And then the best thing happened. I started getting messages from people who had watched some of our episodes who wanted to share their own small space design projects with us. And at the time, there wasn't really much media on tiny homes. You either had the news who were doing these kind of fad stories of, oh, isn't it quaint that these weird people want to live in a shoebox? <laughs> or you had people that were sort of going around showing you these cool spaces that they've designed and built with their cell phones. But when I looked at a tiny house, I didn't see a tiny house. I saw a grand design. I saw a place which was architecturally complicated to manifest. You know, you build a big house, and it's easy to make that space work, right? You can have five bedrooms, you can have two bathrooms, you can have a bowling alley if you want, hobby rooms, whatever you want. If, you're, if you have the size, it's easy, but to make a small space work, there's magic in that. Everything that you add subtracts from something else. And so we wanted to create a show that would celebrate that, that would film tiny houses as if they were grand designs, where we talk about materials, we talk about construction, we talk about design philosophy, life philosophy. We use architectural lenses and drones to show off these tiny houses the way that they deserve. And it's amazing to me now that I stand here in front of you with our show having more than 600 million views around the world, four and a half million subscribers. And that to me is just so humbling. And I think it shows how much this was necessary for people to have something that felt accessible in the design world. And ironically, today, we are actually not only the biggest tiny house show in the world, we're actually one of the biggest architecture shows in the world. Which really <laughs> lot of tiny house purists out there, right? You see them all the time in the comment section of YouTube. That's not tiny. Tiny has to be no bigger than my squirrel's cage. <laughs> Me, I'm not so dogmatic about it. I think, you know, if you're a family of eight downsizing from a 400 square meter home into a 100 square meter home, that's going tiny. That's downsizing. If you live in a tree house, a van, a house truck, a tiny house, a shipping container, an urban home, that can be tiny. So I'm not particularly dogmatic in any of my definitions around these things. But one of the things that I do want to mention is this idea that I see a lot of the time that the tiny house movement is a modern fad. And especially the media loves talking about this. Banks love talking about this. But in reality, you think back across the vast majority of human history, for most of our time inhabiting this earth, we have lived in small, simple, humble shelter. And it would be my argument that in years to come, we'll look back on the Leviathan, McMansion, five bedroom home as being the blip in time that was actually the fad. So I want to talk for a little while about our travels and some of the insights that I've got from around the world as to why people have made the decision to live in tiny homes. And I'm going to blitz through this because the fact you guys are all here and I'm guessing you probably can, can, can work this out for yourselves, but obviously the big one is economic. This one is huge. We live in a time where housing has got absolutely out of control. Since the 80s we've had record low interest rates that have continued to decrease, which has made money cheaper and cheaper and cheaper until we've ended up where we are now in some potentially almost hyperinflationary environment. And we've seen the necessity for people to look into alternative options that are actually affordable. So that, you know, because one of the things that I noticed was even my friends that were able to get onto the housing ladder if they were able to get a mortgage, the first thing that seemed to happen, quality of life. Sorry, Rick, can't come out this weekend, mortgage. And now it's even worse, you know? Most people who purchased houses, million dollar houses last year are already in negative equity, refinancing homes that are now having to pay $1,000 more a month just in their mortgage payments to sustain them. It's getting hard out there for people. So this economic 
this economic reason, it was relevant before, and it's perhaps more relevant than ever today. But it's not just the actual purchasing of the house, it, and, and the fact that this could be a stepping stone into home ownership, something that allows you to free up a little bit of financial resources, it's also the actual living in the home is much cheaper. Energy becomes cheaper, water becomes cheaper, your consumption decreases, and so your general cost of living tends to go down when you're living in a tiny house as well. Obviously, environmental lifestyle is a big one. Uh, so obviously, environmental is, a, is another huge factor as well. Simply consuming less resources. A lot of us right now are pretty aware that things aren't great out there at the moment, and so the idea of consuming a little less and having a slightly smaller environmental footprint is appealing to a lot of people. But lifestyle reasons as well. These homes require less maintenance, less housework. You end up with more free time, the ability to work less. You know, one of the things that really surprised me is that so many people that we visited traveling around the world in tiny houses all loved their jobs. The vast majority of them were not living in a tiny house and going and slugging at some office which, where they didn't enjoy what they were doing. Most of them the reduced cost of living in a tiny house had actually enabled them to follow a life passion. And that was something which really resonated with me as well. And it was one of the reasons why I decided to, event, to, to start the tiny house journey as well, so that I could continue working as an actor. And then, one of my other favorite reasons is the ability to make it yours. You know, most people when they buy conventional homes, they buy homes that have been built by developers. And if not by developers, they buy homes that have been built by other people. But particular with developer-built homes, developer-built homes are designed for nobody in particular, which ends up meaning that they kind of work for no one in particular. So when I came to actually design my own tiny house, I was able to design it around my own specific needs. Simple things like being able to raise up the bench top one meter so that I didn't hurt my back when I was doing the dishes. And by being able to customize your home around your own specific needs, you're actually able to increase the quality of life in your home and the enjoyment of the home. And my small house today fits me better than any of the larger spaces that I've ever inhabited. But it can be also a little bit more extreme than that. This is Fern and Mill. Mills in her 80s and her daughter Fern built her own customized tiny house which had mobility in mind, could have wheelchair access, walker access, had grab rails throughout the home, had structurally reinforced things so that she was able to walk throughout the home and move uninhibited in her own space and in her 80s she was able to regain her livable independence in her own home which I just think is so special. This today is still one of my personal best examples of how good design and good home design can tangibly improve quality of life. And this one's really big, resilience. If the last years have taught us anything, it's that the world can change in a heartbeat, right? And here in Australia, you do not need to be told that. Uh, over the last few years, I've watched with heartbreak as we've seen your forest fires, floods. In New Zealand, we learned it ourselves in the earthquakes. How quickly everything that you've worked for can be stripped away from you. We were filming in the United States during the forest fires there as well. And then, especially in Southern California, people have no idea how many tiny houses are out there. Right? Because it's still in the legal grey area, they're all like tucked away, hiding in fields and on private properties. And then the forest fires came through. But the tiny houses got out. They filled the highways, they filled the Walmart parking spots. <laughs> but the most important thing was they got out of harm's way. And so, for so many people, tiny houses, small, movable structures, there was an, a level of security, there was a level of resilience in that that they couldn't find in a large conventional home. We certainly found that in the Christchurch earthquakes, where now, a decade later, people are still waiting for their government payouts on the damage done to their homes. Where, after the earthquakes, if you had a composting toilet, 
you were the most popular person on your street. <laughs> oh, how quickly that changed. But it's not just resilience from natural disasters and, and the like, it's also, and this is a really big one, economic resilience. Standing here right now, it's a little surreal to me because this is my first international tour since COVID grounded us. I was on tour in Brisbane when our Prime Minister in New Zealand came on the radio and said if you're a Kiwi travelling overseas, it's time to come home or risk getting stuck where you are. And the night before that happened, I had had a dinner in Byron Bay with a bunch of uh, tiny house people from the area. We were having a big catch up. And as we sat there around the dinner table, we talked about what was to come. If you think back to the early days of the pandemic, do you remember the insecurity around that? As we were wondering what was going to happen to our jobs when, when the economy locked down? How we were going to pay for our rent? How we were going to pay our mortgages? And one of the things that we talked about as tiny homeowners was that that was one thing we didn't have to worry about. We didn't have to worry about keeping a roof over our head during an economically tumultuous time. And at the moment, as the world becomes even more unstable than ever, as the stock markets crash, as the US bond market crashes, as the pound goes back to probably where it should be, this is more relevant than ever. There were a lot of lessons, I think, that came from the pandemic. And regardless of where your mind settled further down the track, whether you believe the virus was a risk to us or not, or any of those things, think back to the start, where there was that moment in time when you switched on the news, when you picked up a newspaper, when you picked up your smartphone, and we were filled with images of hospitals filling up over capacity, mass graves being dug in New York City. And inevitably, there was a moment in time where each of us had the thought cross our mind that this could be how we die. This could be how we lose a loved one. Death has been called the great equalizer because in the end we all end up in the same place. Whether you're rich or poor, whether you're homeless or a billionaire, in the end, your house, your car, your clothes, your jewelry, your stock portfolio, we don't get to take any of it with us. And one of the things that that encourages us to do when we're confronted with death and the possibility of our own death is it encourages us to evaluate our lives, the quality of our lives, how we spend our time, what are those things that are really important to us. In the end, thinking about those things, I think lockdown taught us a lot more than just the fact that being locked down in a tiny house really does suck, and that working from home is a good idea and we should probably keep doing that. Do you remember a few years ago, there was a, a viral post that was going around, and it was written by a palliative care nurse where she talked about deathbed wishes of her patients. And she listed the five most common deathbed wishes from people who were about to draw their last breath. And I'm just going to take a quick moment to share those with you now. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself. Not to worry so much about what other people thought or what society thought I should do. What did I want to do with my life? And how many of those things did I act on? I wish I didn't work so hard. I would have loved to have spent more time with my kids. I would have loved to spend more time playing out in the sun and less time sitting in an office, working hard to earn money to purchase things that maybe I didn't really need. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. 
be honest with people, tell them how I really felt, express how I felt about situations. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I had nurtured those relationships, that I had spent more time with people that I love. And I wish that I'd let myself be happier. Because a lot of the time we don't realize how much of our happiness is actually a choice. It's not always a choice. Life always happens and everything's always circumstantial, but there's always an ability to shift our perception into a state where we can actually be happy right where we are. And that's something that a lot of people don't realize right until the end. So okay, that's a bit depressing. How does this relate to tiny houses? Well, over the years, one of the things that I've realized about tiny house living is that the house is the least important part of tiny house living. When I ask people what it is that they love about their tiny home, the answer isn't, well, I've got a comfy bed. It's not, I love my multi-functional furniture. It's not, I'm really happy that I've got so much storage in my kitchen. Almost without fail, the answer that I get is freedom. I love the freedom that tiny house living has offered me. Financial freedom. Time freedom. Freedom from housework. Whatever it may be. And one of the things that I learned is that the smaller our homes, the more space we actually have to fill. Not with material possessions, but with things that really matter. Things that are innately important to us as human beings. And this was one of the things that I set out to discover on this journey when I made the decision to live in a tiny house myself. When I started the show and traveled the world talking to people about their homes and making these films and telling their stories, the question that I had in my head was this. Can a smaller home help us to create a bigger life? And now, after 10 years of traveling the globe, telling the stories of these remarkable people and showing their beautiful homes, I can, with all of my heart, tell you that the answer is absolutely yes. Thank you very much. It would now be my pleasure to take your questions. seen on the show represent only a small portion that we've seen. I mean, gosh, how many are out here today? Um, and also one of the tricky things is uh, about filming for the show is because tiny houses still exist in a little bit of a legal gray area, some of the most amazing places, some of the most creative places, especially if they're not mobile homes, we haven't actually been able to film and put on camera. Um, but, you know, I'm constantly amazed at, at the threshold to where the tiny house movement has become and how many of these homes exist out there now. And I think to sort of prove that point is now that not, not only do we have all of these fantastic tiny house manufacturers and builders, the number of support industries that have risen around it, both here in Australia, New Zealand and around the world, we now have companies that are dedicated to moving tiny houses. That's all they do is shift tiny houses about all day. We have companies that all they do is offer tiny house insurance. All they do is offer tiny house lending and mortgages. So the amount of support industries that have risen around it, I think really goes to show the threshold that the tiny house movement has reached now. We, we, we are no longer on the fringe. This has gone mainstream. Hi, I'm Jessica. Um, I'm a 
Um, Hi. Apart from your own, which build has been your favorite so far? Oh, don't ask me that. <laughs> that is such a hard question to answer. I think in, in, in all of the builds, there are, there are so many things that I love, and they're all so different from one another. But I think one of the builds that I always go back to is one of the tiny homes that I saw in Japan. Very, very tiny. It was uh, two traveling nurses who had this tiny house, and it was sort of quintessentially all of the things that I absolutely fell in love with tiny house design for. It was beautiful, it was constructed from natural materials, it was small, it was mobile, it was simple, and the design philosophy that went into that home was just exquisite. And so I think probably if I had to pick one, it would be that, but honestly, uh, ask me on a different day, you'll probably get a different answer. Yeah. Hi. Hi there, Bryce. Hi. So, I had never heard of a tiny house until two, maybe three weeks ago. Wow. Which rock are you living under? I'm a tiny one. It's a boulder. Tell me about that. <laughs> and so, she showed me your videos two or three weeks ago. Where would you say would be a good place to start other than your book and your channel for someone who's just getting a tiny house? Well, I would say the first place to start is your book and your channel for someone who's just getting into tiny houses. Yeah, that's a really good question. One of the cool things about the tiny house movement is that we have got a really strong community. So if you're looking at DIYing or if you're just looking for general information, I can almost guarantee wherever you live, you can jump onto Facebook and have a look at community groups where people are really, really open and really happy to share. Uh, whether you have questions regarding local legalities or uh, local material sourcing or building information, solar, off the grid, any of those things, most of the community groups have really supportive people who are totally willing to lend you a hand. We set up a, a community group in New Zealand for, for people who are looking at building tiny homes themselves and that community group now is 25,000 members strong and it's amazing. If anyone has a question there, you can post a question, come back 15 minutes later, and there's a whole thread of answers. So it's really cool, and, th and this is one of the cool things about the Tiny House community, is just how helpful people are, and how willing they are to impart their knowledge and, and help get you started on your journey. Hi. I think she will. Her name's me. Hi, Lee. The most creative tiny house that I've built, well I've only built two, um, so if I had to pick one of them, I would definitely say it's the one that I built. Okay, actually that's not true. Because <laughs> I've technically built three now, you just don't know about the third one. Uh, so actually the new one that's coming out, which we're going to have a video coming out on our, cha our channel later, incorporates a lot of really, really cool design that we have never seen before in the tiny house world, so I'm super excited to be sharing all of that with you. But if I had to say across the board of all of the tiny houses that I've ever built, uh, that I've ever seen, that is almost an impossible question. You know, one of the things that I, I love about tiny houses is the way that people customize their homes for their own particular needs. And one of the things that I love about them is they're not cookie cutter. I can't say which is the most creative because in honesty, they're all just so creative. We've seen tiny houses that are shaped like pine cones that hang from the redwoods in California. We've seen a tiny house in the snowy mountains of Oakuni that was shaped like a giant pumice rock. We've, and, and one of the things that I love is that a tiny house is an opportunity for the owner to absolutely express their creativity and bring their dream to life in a way that is much more affordable because it's smaller. And one of the things that keeps me coming back to doing what I do is just that, you know, when I, when I started this show, I was like, yeah, it's a box. Like, of course, I'm probably going to do this for six months. Like, there's only so many ways that you can build a tiny house. There's only so much that you can put in something the size of a parking space. But now, after 10 years of filming this show, I honestly believe that there is no limit to human creativity and thus also no limit to the cool ideas that we're going to see manifesting into tiny houses. And especially as regulations change, as materials change, as technology changes, they're just going to get cooler and cooler.
G'day. Hey. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, bit of a specific question. Are you familiar with rocket stoves and have you seen them implemented in time? You mean like uh, permaculture rocket stoves? Yeah. Like, uh, I haven't seen them implemented inside tiny houses. I've seen them outside of tiny houses, uh, not so much inside. We, we did visit one tiny house that had a pizza oven inside it, believe it or not. Um, I've seen it, uh, rocket stoves are quite common in earth building. You know, and, and especially you know where you have a little bit more space and where they make a lot of sense because you're able to sort of utilize the stone, you build it, uh, utilize the sides and build a lot of uh, thermal mass. Uh, but in general, in like a conventional tiny house on wheels, I have yet to see one with a rocket stove. Well, folks, if you've got some questions, it's your last opportunity. Just a few minutes to go. Get your hand up in the air, and we'll get over there. Hi Bryce. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, what would you say is your top five must haves of a tiny home? You know. Or top three if it's easier. I. I'm not going to give you one. What I am going to say is that if you're building a tiny house, the best thing that you can do is to know yourself. Observe yourself. Look at how you utilize your space because. When a tiny house, within the context of a tiny house, there is no like top five must-haves that are going to be every person's must-have. Your needs are going to be so specific. And so the best thing that you can do, if you're designing a tiny house and you want to know the things that are absolutely going to make yourself happy, know yourself. And be honest with yourself about your habits, right? Like, if you're somebody who has never evolved past microwaving a can of soup for dinner, don't waste space with a chef's kitchen in your tiny house. If you're somebody that works from home, then make sure that you prioritize space for that. If you are somebody who doesn't really like the fact that you spend eight hours a day watching television, and yet you watch television for eight hours a day, be honest with yourself about that and prioritize in your space to make sure that you've got a good sized television and a comfy couch to sit on. The more honest with you are, the more honest with yourself that you are about your needs, the better the experience that you're going to have living in a tiny house. Design for who you really are, and not the aspirational person that you want to be. That would be my number one tip for designing a house. Right, well, thank you very much. Just one last question, if we could, Bros. Yeah, is this still working? Here we go. Hi. Hi Bryce, nice to meet you. I'm Rowena. Hi. Um, I was just really curious, you know, there's kind of a lot of the tiny homes on mobile. Are there really a lot of people that move around a lot or they often just find permanent places? It, it depends. I would say in, in the context of most tiny houses, when we talk about them being mobile, it's that we can shift them when we have to. Most people would be parked up for six months, a year, a few years, and then potentially for whatever reason, change of jobs, relocate, shift the tiny house to a different location. Quite commonly, people will make a land purchase and move the tiny house onto their own land once they've used the tiny house as a stepping stone to save a bit of capital to be able to get onto their own property. Um, but we have certainly seen tiny houses that, that are on the road, lived in by digital nomads all the time. Probably more common in the United States, just where I mean, they can just tow whatever they want on their roads. They do not give a damn about the way. So, and their trucks are so huge, and they have their own oil companies, and so they can just get away with that in a way that we can't really hear, especially not in New Zealand, where our weight regulations are even stricter than here in Australia. Uh, but I think as the movement grows, and as we see more people uh, sort of working from home and maybe adapting more to the digital nomad lifestyle, I think we're going to see more and more tiny houses that are designed to travel full time. Uh, yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much. Nice. Yeah. Thank you.